The Life and Remains, Letters, Lectures, and Poems of the Rev. Robert Murray McKean. Chapter 5, Days of Revival. They shall bring up, as among the grass, as willows by the watercourses. Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 4. His people, who had never ceased to pray for him, welcomed his arrival among them with the greatest joy. He reached Dundee on Thursday afternoon, and in the evening on the same day, being the usual time for prayer in St. Peter's, after a short meditation, he hastened to the church, there to render thanks to the Lord, and to speak once more to his flock. The appearance of the church that evening, and the aspect of the people, he never could forget. Many of his brethren were present to welcome here, him and to hear the first words of his open lips. There was not a seat in the church unoccupied. The passages were completely filled, and the stairs up to the pulpit were crowded, on the one side with the aged, and on the other with eagerly listening children. Many a face was seen anxiously glazing on their restored pastor. Many were weeping under the unhealed wounds of conviction. All were still and calm, intensely earnest to hear. He gave out Psalms 66 and the manner of singing which had been remarked since the revival began appeared to him peculiarly sweet so tender and affecting as if the people felt that they were praising a present God. After solemn prayer with them he was able to preach for above an hour not knowing how long he might be permitted to proclaim the glad tidings he seized that opportunity not to tell of his journeyings but to show the way of life to sinners. His subject was 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 4, the matter, the manner, and the accompaniment of Paul's preaching. It was a night to be remembered. On coming out of the church, he found the road to his house crowded with old and young who were waiting to welcome him back. He had to shake hands with many at the same time, and before this happy multitude would disperse, had to speak some words of life to them again and pray with them where they stood. To thy name, O Lord, said he that night, when he returned to his home. To thy name, O Lord, be all the glory. A month afterwards, he was visited by one who had hitherto stood out against all the singular influence of the revival, but who that night was deeply awakened under his words, so that the arrow festered in her soul, till she came crying, O my hard, hard heart. On the Sabbath, he preached to his flock in the afternoon. He chose Second Chronicles 5, verses 13 and 14 as his subject, and in the close, his hearers remembered well how affectionate and solemnly he said, Dearly beloved and longed for, I now begin another year of my ministry among you, and I am resolved, if God give me health and strength, that I will not let a man, woman, or child among you alone until you have at least heard the testimony of God concerning his Son, either to your condemnation or salvation. And I will pray, as I have done before, that if the Lord will indeed give us a great outpouring of his Spirit, he will do it in such a way that it will be evident to the weakest child among you that it is the Lord's work and not man's. I think I may say to you, as Rutherford said to his people, your heaven would be two heavens to me. And if the Lord be pleased to give me a crown from among you, I do here promise in his sight that I will cast it at his feet, saying, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that setteth upon the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. It was much feared for a time that a jealous spirit would prevail among the people of St. Peter's, some saying, I am in Paul, and the others, I am of Cephas. Those recently converted were apt to regard their spiritual father in a light in which they could regard none besides. But Mr. Machini had received from the Lord a holy disinterestedness that suppressed every feeling of envy. Many wondered at the single-heartedness he was enabled to exhibit. He could certainly say, I have no desire but the salvation of my people by whatever instrument. Never perhaps was there one place in better circumstances for testing the revival impartially, and solemn has any revival been more fully tested. He came among a people 
whose previous character he knew. He found a work wrought among them during his absence, in which he had not had any direct share. He returned home to go out and in among them, and to be a close observer of all that had taken place. And after a faithful and prayerful examination, he did most unhesitantly say that the Lord had wrought great things, whereof he was glad. And in the case of many of those whose souls were saved in that revival, he discovered remarkable answers to the prayers of himself and of those who had come to the truth before he left them. He wrote to me his impression of the work when he had been a few weeks among his people. Reverend and A. Bernard Collis, 2nd December, 1839. My dear Andrew, I begin upon no paper because I have no other on hand but our thin, travailing paper. I have much to tell you and to praise the Lord for. I am grieved to hear that there are no marks of the Spirit's work among about Colas during your absence, but if Satan drive you to your knees, he will soon find cause to repent it. Remember how fathers do to their children when they ask bread. How much more shall our Heavenly Father give all good things to them that ask Him? Remember the rebuke which I once got from old Mr. Dem uh, Dempster of Denny after preaching to his people. I was highly pleased with your discourse, but in prayer it struck me that you thought God unwilling to give. Remember Daniel. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. And do not think you are forgotten by me, as long as I have health and grace to pray. Everything here I have found in a state better than I expected. The night I arrived, I preached to such a congregation as I never saw before. I do not think another person could have got into the church. And there was every sign of the deepest and tenderest emotion. R. MacDonald was with me and prayed. Affliction and success in the ministry have taught and quickened him. I preached on 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 4, and felt what I have often heard, that it is easy to preach where the Spirit of God is. On the Friday night, Mr. Burns preached. On the Sabbath, I preached on that wonderful passage, 2 Chronicles 5, verse 13 and 14. Mr. Burns preached twice, morning and evening. His views of divine truth are clear and commanding. There is a great deal of substance in what he preaches, and his manner is very powerful, so much so that he sometimes makes me tremble. In private, he is very prayerful and seems to feel his danger of falling into pride. I have seen many of the awakened and many of the saved. Indeed, this is a pleasant place compared with what it was once was. Some of the awakened are still in the deepest anxiety and distress. Their great error is exactly what your brother Horace told me. They think that coming to Christ is some strange act of their mind, different from believing what God has said of his Son, so much so that they will tell you with one breath, I believe all that God hath said, and yet with the next complain that they cannot come to Christ or to, uh, close with Christ. It is very hard to deal with this delusion. I find some old people deeply shaken. They feel insecure. One confirmed drunkard had, has come to me and is, I believe, now a saved man. Some little children are evidently saved. All I have yet seen are related to converts of my own. One, 11 years old, is a singular incident of divine grace. When I asked if she desired to be made holy, she said, Indeed, I often wish I was Hawa, that I might sin no more. AL of 15 is a fine, tender hearted believer. WS 10 is also a happy boy. Many of my dear old children in the Lord are much advanced, much more full of joy, their hearts lifted up in the ways of the Lord. I have found many more savingly impressed under my own ministry than I knew of. Some have come to tell me, in one case, a whole family said, I have hardly met with anything to grieve me. Surely the Lord hath dealt bountifully with me. I fear, however, that the Great Spirit has in some measure passed by. I hope soon to return to greater power than ever. The weak meetings are thinner now. I will 
turn two of them into my classes soon, and so give solid regular instruction, of which they stand greatly in need. I have not met with one case of extravagance or false fire, although doubtless there may be many. At first, they used to follow in a body to our house and expected many in address and prayer by the road. They have given up this now. I preached last Sabbath twice, first on Isaiah chapter 28, verses 14 through 18, and then on Revelations 12:11. Overcome, overcame by the blood of the Lamb. It was a very solemn day. The people willingly sat till it was dark. Many make it a place of bochim, B-O-C-H-I-M. Still there is nothing of the power which has been. I have tried to persuade Mr. Burns to stay with us, and I think he will remain in Dundee. I feel fully stronger in body than when I left you. Instead of exciting me, there is everything to solemnize and still my feelings. Eternity sometimes seems very near. I would like your advice about prayer meetings, how to consolidate them, what rules should be followed, if any, whether there should be mere reading of the word in prayer or free converse also on the passage. We begun today a ministerial prayer meeting to be held every Monday at 11 o'clock for an hour and a half. This is a great comfort and may be a great blessing. Of course, we do not invite the colder ministers. They would only damp our meeting. Tell me if you think this right. And now, dear Andrew, I must be done, for it is very late. May your people share in the quickening that has come over Dundee. I feel it a very powerful argument with many. Will you be left dry when others are getting drops of heavenly dew? Try this with your people. I think it will um, probably we shall have another communion again before the regular one. It seems very desirable. You will come and help us, and perhaps Horace too. I thought of coming back by Colas from Arrow, if our Glasgow meeting had not come in the way. Will you set a going your Wednesday meeting again immediately? Farewell, dear Andrew. O oh, man greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to thee, be strong, yea, be strong, yours forever and ever. To Mr. Burns, he thus expressed himself on December the 19th. My dear brother, I shall never be able to thank you for all your labors among the precious souls committed to me. And what is worse, I can never thank God fully for his kindness and grace, which every day appears to me more remarkable. He has answered prayer to me and all that has happened in a way which I have never told anyone. Again on the 31st, Stay where you are, dear brother, as long as the Lord has any work for you to do. Footnote. Mr. Burns was at the time in Perth, and there had begun to be some movement among the dry bones. End of footnote. If I know my own heart, its only desire is that Christ may be glorified by souls flocking to him and abiding in him and reflecting his image. And whether it be in Perth or Dundee, should it signify little to us, you know, I told you in my mind plainly that I thought the Lord had so blessed you in Dundee that you were called to a fuller and deeper work there. But if the Lord accommodates you to other places, I have nothing to object. The Lord strengthened my body and soul last Sabbath, and my spirit also was glad. The people were much alive in the Lord's service. But, oh, dear brother, the most the Christ is still, the rich are almost untroubled, his evidence on this subject is given fully in his answers to the queries put by a committee of Aberdeen Presbytery. And in a note to a friend, he incidentally mentions the pleasing results of this widespread awakening. I find many souls saved under my own ministry, whom I never knew of before. They are not afraid to come out now. It has become so common a thing to be concerned about this soul. At that time also, many came from a distance. One came from the north, who had been a year in deep distress of soul, to seek Christ in Dundee. In his brief diary, he records, on December 3rd, that twenty anxious souls had that night been conversing with him, many of them very deeply interested. 
he occasionally fixed an evening for the purpose of meeting with those who were awakened, and in one of his notebooks there are at least 400 visits recorded made to him by inquiring souls in the course of that and the following years. He observed that those who had been believers formerly had got their heart enlarged and were greatly established. In some seemed able to feed upon the truth in a new manner, as when one related to him how there had for some time appeared a glory in the reading of the word in public, quite different from reading it alone. At the same time he saw backslidings, both among those whom believers had considered really converted, and among those who had been deeply convinced, though never reckoned among the really saved. His notes in his books, called to see, poor lad, he seems to have gone back from Christ, led away by evil company. And yet I felt sure of him at one time. What blind creatures ministers are. Man, look at the outward appearance. One morning he had visited by one of his flock, proposing a concert of prayer on the following Monday, in behalf of those who have fallen back, that God's Spirit might reawaken them. So observant were the believers as well as their pastor of declensation, far away, among those who were awakened, but never truly converted. He mentions one case. January 9, 1840, met with the case of one who had been frightened during the last work, so that her bodily injury, bodily health was injured. She seems to have no care now about her soul. It has only filled her mouth with evil speaking. That many who promised fair drew back and walked no more, but Jesus is true. Out of about 800 souls who, during the months of their revival, conversed with different ministers in apparent anxiety, no wonder, surely, if many proved to have been impressed only for a time. President Edwards considered it likely that, in such cases, the proportion of real conversions might resemble the proportion of blossoms in spring and fruit in autumn. Nor can anything be more unreasonable than to doubt the truth of all because of the deceit of some. The world itself does not so act in judging of its own. The world reckons upon the possibility of being mistaken in many cases, and yet does not cease to believe that there is honesty and truth to be found. One of themselves, a poet of their own, hath, has said with no less justice than beauty, Angels are bright still, though the brightest fall. And though foul things put on the brows of grace, yet grace must look so. But above all, we have the authority of the Word of God declaring that such backslidings are the very test of the true church. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. 1 Corinthians 11.19 It is not, however, meant that any, of, any who had really believed went back to perdition. On the contrary, it is the creed of every sound evangel evangelical church that those who do not go back to perdition were persons who never really believed in Jesus. Their eyes may have been opened to see the dread realities of sin and of the wrath to come, but if they saw not righteousness for their guilty souls in the Savior, there is nothing in all the scriptures to make us expect that they will continue awake. Awake, thou that sleepeth, and Christ will give thee light, is the call inviting sinners to a point far beyond mere conviction. One who, for a whole year, went back to Cali, said, Your sermon on the corruption of the heart made me despair. And so I gave myself up to my old ways, attending dances, learning songs, etc. A knowledge of our guilt and a sense of danger will not of themselves keep us from falling. Nay, these, if alone, may as in the above case, thrust us down the slippery places. We are truly secure only when our eye is on Jesus and our hand locked in His, so that the history of backsliding, instead of leading us to doubt the reality of grace and believers, will only be found to teach us two great lessons, viz. the vast importance of pressing immediate salvation on awakened souls 
and the reasonableness of standing in doubt of all, however deep their convictions, who have not truly fled to the hope set before them. There was another ground of prejudice against the whole work, arising from the circumstance that the Lord had employed in it young men not long engaged in the work of the ministry rather than the fathers in Israel. But herein it was that sovereign grace shone forth the more conspicuously. Do such objectors suppose that God intends the honor of man in a work of revival? Is it not the honor of his own name that he seeks? Had it been his wish to give the glory to man at all, then indeed it might have been asked, why does he pass by the older pastors and call for the inexperienced youth? But when sovereign grace was coming to bless a region in the way that would redound most to the glory of the Lord, can we conceive a wiser plan than to use the sling of David in bringing down the Philistine? If, however, there be some whose prejudice is from the root of envy, let such hear the remonstration of Richard Baxter to the jealous ministers of his day. What, malignant Christ in gifts, for which he should have the glory, and all because they seem to hinder our glory? Does not every man owe thanks to God for his brethren's gifts, not only as having himself part in them, as the foot has the benefit of the guidance of the eye, but also because of his own ends, may be obtained by his brethren's gifts, as well as by his own? A fearful thing that any man that hath the least of the fear of God should so envy at God's gifts that he would rather his carnal hearers were unconverted and the drowsy not awakened than that it should be done by another who may be preferred before them. Footnote, Reformed Pastor 4.2 The work of the Spirit went on, the stream flowing gently, for the heavenly showers had fallen, and the overflowing of the waters had passed by. Mr. Machini became more than ever vigilant and discriminating in dealing with souls, observing also that some were influenced more by feelings of strong attachment to the pastor personally than by the power of the truths he preached. He became more reserved in his dealings with them so that some thought there was a little coldness or repulsiveness in his manner. If there did appear anything of this nature to some, certainly it was no indication of diminished compassion, but on the contrary it proceeded from a scrupulous anxiety to guard, against, guard others against the deceitful feelings of their own souls. A few notes of his work occurred at this period, November 27, 1839, a pleasant meeting in the Cross Church on Wednesday last for the seamen. All that spoke seemed to honor the Savior. I had to move thanksgiving to God for His mercies. This has been a real blessing to Dundee. It should not be forgotten in our prayers and thanksgivings. November 28th, Thursday evening, much comfort in speaking. There was often an awful stillness, spoke on Jeremiah 6.14. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, etc. December 1st, this evening came a tender Christian, so far as I can see, an exposition of that text. I will go softly, or of the other, thou shalt not open thy mouth any more. A child of shame made one of honor. Her sister was awakened under Mr. Baxter's words in St. Peter's, of whom he asked, Would you like to be holy? She replied, Indeed, I often wish I were dead, that I might sin no more. December 3rd, preached six times within these two days. December 8th, saw JT in fever. She seems really in Christ now. Tells me how deeply my words sank into her soul when I was away. AM stayed to tell me her joy. JB walked home with me, telling me what God had done for his soul, when one day I had stopped at a quarry on account of a shower of rain and took shelter with my pony 
in the engine house. He had simply pointed to the fire of the furnace and said, What does that remind you of? And the words had remained deep in the man's soul. December the 11th, a woman awakened that night I preached in J.D.'s Green about two years ago on Ezekiel 20:43. For 20 years, she had been out of church privileges and now, for the first time, came trembling to ask restoration. Surely, Emmanuel is in this place and even old sinners are flocking to him. I have got an account of about 20 prayer meetings connected with my flock, many open ones, many fellowship meetings, only one or two have anything like exhortation super added to the word. These, I think, it must be our care to change, if possible, least error and pride creep in. The only other difficulty is this. In two of the female meetings, originally fellowship meetings, anxious female inquirers have been admitted. They do not pray, but only hear. In one, M and J had felt the rising of pride to a great degree. In the other, M could not be persuaded that there was any danger of pride. This case will require prayerful deliberation. My mind at present is that there is great danger from it, the praying members feeling themselves on a different level from the others, and anything like female teaching as a public teacher seems clearly condemned in the Word of God. December the 12th, felt very feeble all day, and as if I could not do any more work in the vineyard. Evening, felt more of the reality of Emmanuel's intercession. The people also were evidently subdued by more than a human testimony. One soul waited, sobbing most piously. She could give no more account of herself than that she was a sinner, and did not believe that God would be merciful to her. When I showed how I found mercy, her only answer was, But you were not sick a sinner as me. December 18th, went to Glasgow, along with A.B., preached in St. George's to a full audience in the cause of the Jews, felt real help in time of need. This was one of, my, of his many journeys from place to place in behalf of Israel, relating the things seen and heard among the Jews of Palestine, and other lands. December the 22nd, preached in Anderson Church with a good deal of inward peace and comfort. December 23rd, interesting meeting with the Jewish committee. In the evening, met a number of God's people. The horror of some good people in Glasgow at the preliminary views is very great, while at the same time, their objections appear very weak. December 31st, young communicants, to have made application to be admitted, under 11 years of age, four that are only 14, three who are 15 or 16, January 1st, 1840. I woke early by the kind providence of God and had uncommon freedom and fervency in keeping the concert for prayer this morning before light. Very touching interview with MP, who still refuses to be comforted. While and able to cry after a glorious Emmanuel along with her. How I wish I had her bitter convictions of sin. Another call this evening, who says she was awakened and brought to Christ during the sermon on the morning of December 1st on the covenant with death, gave clear answers but seems too unmoved for the one really changed. January 2nd visited six families, was refreshed and solemnized at each of them, spoke of the word made flesh, and of all the paths of the Lord be in mercy and truth. Visited in the evening by some interesting souls, one a believing little boy, another complaining she cannot come to Christ for the hardness of her heart, another once awakened under my ministry, Again, thoroughly awakened and brought to Christ under Horace Bonnard's sermon at the communion. She is the only saved one in her family, awfully persecuted by father and mother. Lord, stand up for thine own. Make known by their consistency under suffering the power and beauty of thy grace. Evening, Mr. Mueller, Mr. Miller preached 
diligently on the love of Christ constraineth us. His account of the Protestants of France were very interesting. The work of God at NISMES, where it is said that there are no more fishing with line, but dragging with the nets. Read a letter from Mr. Cumming, described the work of Perth, and in treating the prayers of God's children. This last reference is to the awakening, which took place in St. Leonard's Church, Perth, on the last night of the year when Mr. Burns, along with her pastor, Mr. Ma- um, Millen, M-I-L-N-E, was preaching. Mr. B. had intended to return to Dundee for the Sabbath, but was detained by the plain inclinations of the Lord's presence. At one meeting, the work was so glorious that one night about 150 persons at one time seemed bowed down under a sense of their guilt, and above 200 came next day to the church in the forenoon to converse with their souls. This awakening was the commencement of a solid work of grace, both in that town and its neighborhood, much fruit of which is to be found there at this day in souls that are walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And it was in the spring of the same year that in Colus, at our weekly prayer meeting, when two brethren were ministering, we received a blessed shower from the Lord. His journal proceeds, January 3rd, an inquirer came, awakened under my ministry, two and a half years ago. January 5th, two came, MB, sorely wounded, with the forenoon discourse. January 12th, imitated a concert for prayer that unworthy communicates might be kept back. The Lord's children prepared for the feast and the ministers furnished from on high. January 13th, kept concert of prayer this morning with my dear people. Did not find the same enlargement as usual. May 5th, Thursday evening, preached on Zechariah 3 through Joshua. Was led to speak uncertainly no, speak searchingly about making Christ the minister of sin. One young woman cried aloud very bitterly. MB came to tell me that poor M is like to have her life taken by her parents. A young woman also who is still concerned and persecuted by her father. A young man came to tell me that he had found Christ. Roll on, thou river of life. Visit every dwelling. Save a multitude of souls. Come, Holy Spirit. Come quickly. March 25th. Last night at Forfar speaking for Israel to a small band of friends of the Jews. Fearfully wicked place. The cry of it ascends up before God like that of Sodom. March 31st. Met with young communicants on Wednesday and Friday. On the latter night especially, very deep feeling manifested in sobbings. Visits of several. One dear child, nine years old, sick in bed. April 1st, Presbyterian Day. Passed the constitution of two new churches. Blessed be God. May he raise up faithful pastors for them both. Dude Hope and Wallace-F-E-U-S. Proposal also for the Mariner's Church. A fast day fixed for the present state of the church. April 5th, Saturday evening. Spoke to 24 young persons, one by one, almost all affected about their souls. April 6th, lovely ride and meditation in a retired grove. April 7th, impressed tonight with a complete necessity of preaching to my people in their own lanes and closes. In no other way will God's word ever reach them. Tonight spoke in St. Andrew's Church to a very crowded assembly in behalf of Israel. Was helped to speak plainly to their own consciences. Lord bless it. Shake this town. April the 13th, spoke in private to nearly 30 young communicants, all in one room, going round each and advising for the benefit of all. April 22nd, wrote to C-O-L-L-E-S-S-I-E, parenthesis, F-I-F-E, and parenthesis, and Kirk uh, 80. Sweet time alone in... Colesi Woods. July 30th. One lad came to me in great distress, wishing, wishing to know 
if he should confess his little dishonesties to his master. About this time, he has noted down, I was visiting the other day and came to a locked door. What does this mean? Torment me not, torment me not. Ah, uh, Satan is mighty still, referring to Mark 5, verse 7. A few of his communion seasons are recorded. We could have desired a record of them all. The first of which he has detailed any particulars is the one he enjoyed soon after returning home. January 19, 1840. Stormy morning with gushing torrents of rain, but cleared up in answer to prayer. Sweet union in prayer with Mr. Cumming and afterwards with Andrew Bernard. Found God in secret. Asked especially that the very sight of the broken bread and poured out wine might be blessed to some souls. Then pride will be hidden from man. Church well filled, many standing. Preached the action sermon on John 17, verse 24. Father, I will, etc. Had considerable nearness to God in prayer, more than usual. And also freedom in preaching. Although I was ashamed of such poor views of Christ's glory, the people were in very desirable frame of attention, hanging on the word, felt great help in fencing the table. From Acts 5, verse 3. Lying to the Holy Ghost. Came down and served the first table with much more calmness and collectedness than ever I remember to have enjoyed. Enjoyed a sweet season while A.B. served the next table. He dwelt chiefly on believing the words of Christ about his fullness and the promise of the Father. There were six tables altogether. The people more and more moved to the end. At the last table, every head seemed bent like a bulrush while Andrew Bernard spoke of the ascension of Christ. Helped a little in the address. Now to him who is able to keep you, etc. And in the concluding prayer, footnote, see the remains for some of that day's solemn words, end of footnote. One little boy in retiring said, this has been another bonny day. Many of the little ones seemed deeply attentive. Mr. Cunning, Cunning and Mr. Burns preached in the school the most of the day. In the evening, Mr. C. preached on the pillar cloud on every dwelling. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 5. Some very sweet, powerful words. Mr. Burns preached in the schoolroom. When the church emptied, a congregation formed in the lower school and began to sing. Sang several psalms with them and spoke on, Behold, I stand at the door. Going home, A.L. said, Pray for me. I am quite happy, and so is H. Altogether, a day of the revelation of Christ. A sweet day to myself, and I am persuaded to many souls. Lord, make us meet for the table above. Another of these communicant seasons, recorded in April 1840. Sabbath the 19th, sweet and precious day, preached action sermon on Zechariah 12.10 and Zechariah 13.1. 1. A good deal assisted. Awesome fencing the tables on Psalms 39. Search me, O God, least at serving the tables. O, I will be wealthy. And to him that overcometh, though the thanksgiving was sweet, communicant with calm joy. Old Mr. Burns served two tables, Horace Bernard five. There was a very melting frame visible among the people. Helped a good deal in the address on My Sheep Hear My Voice. After seven, before all was over, met before eight, old Mr. Burns preached on a word in season, gave three parting texts, and so concluded this blessed day. Many were filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Monday the 20th. Mr. Gerson, that's G-R-I-E-R-S-O-N, preached on, Ye are come to Mount Zion, on instructive word, pleasant walk with H.B., Evening sermon from him to the little children on the new heart. Truly delightful. Prayer meeting after. I began, then old Mr. Burns, then Horace, in a very lively manner, on the woman of Samaria. The people were brought into a very tender frame. After the blessing, a multitude remained. One, A.N., was like a person struck through with a dart. She could neither stand nor go. Many were looking at her with faces of horror. Others were comforting her in a very kind manner, bidding her to look to Jesus. 
Mr. Burns went to the desk and told them of Kill's life. Still, they would not go away. I spoke a few words more to the those around me, telling them of the lovingness of Christ and the hardness of their hearts, that they could be so unmoved once one was so deeply wounded. The sobbing soon spread till many heads were bent down, and the church was filled with sobbing. Many whom I did not know were now affected. After prayer we dismissed near midnight. Many followed us. One in grief, great agony, prayed that she might find Christ that very night. So ends this blessed season. The prayer meeting on the Monday evening following the communion was generally enjoyed by all the Lord's people and by the ministers who assisted in a peculiar manner. Often all felt the last day of the feast to be the great day. Souls that had been enjoying the feast were then, at its conclusion, taking hold of the arm of the beloved and the prospect of going up through the wilderness.